Let's stand and sing together. Where can we run? Where can we hide? Where can we run? Where can we hide? And you will not find us. Deepest of depths, highest of heights, your love chases us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, we can't escape your love. Oh, and we will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. We will never see the end. We will never see the end. Of your goodness. Well, good morning, church. As we see these, as we sing these lines, I want you to think about what Matt preached on last week, which was when after Adam and Eve sin and they realize that they're naked and, and they're ashamed and they realize I have to cover myself, I have to cover my shame, I have to hide from God, I don't want him to know what I've done. And they're in the garden and they're hiding. And God is still walking in the garden. He's walking in the garden. He's calling out to them, and he's looking for them. And I want to remind you, church, that's what we're singing about in this song. It says, where can we run and where can we hide where you will not find us? And that sounds really ominous, right? Or you will find us. And then, but it continues, says, your love, it chases us. So God didn't find Adam and Eve just to curse them. He didn't find Adam and Eve to say, I, I'm angry with you, and out of the garden you go. He found them to have a relationship with them and to restore them to something and to still give them hope in Jesus. So as we, let's sing verse 1 and that chorus again and, and let's think about all the times where we've sinned and we've wanted to hide and run away from God and, and try and be in a place where God won't find our sin and won't find our shame, but instead we can rest in the assurance that God is going to find us. He already knows and he's not looking at us in anger. He's not He's not here to be upset with us. He's here to, co to cover us with uh, and cover our shame with Jesus and to remind us of the blood that was spilt on our behalf. So let's sing that again. Let's sing, where can we run and where can we hide? And sing, sing with boldness, knowing that that's what God does for us. He finds us and he covers us. Here we go. Where can we run? Where can we hide? That you will not find us. Deepest of depths, the highest of heights, your love it chases us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, we can't escape your love. Ooh, and we will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. We will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. Though we walk through the fire, oh, we pass through the flood. You will be with us. Though we walk through the valley, the darkest of night, your love will be our light. And we are in plenty, oh, we are in want. You'll always be in us. And we will never see the end. We 
will never see the end of your goodness. We will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. In our darkest hours, on our hardest days, we do not have to be afraid. You will never leave. You will not forsake the promises that you have made. And in our darkest hours, on our hardest days, we do not have to be afraid. You will never leave. You will not forsake the promises that you have made. your goodness we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness and we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness we will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. in my sorrow, alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin, your love made a way to let mercy come in, when death was arrested and my life began was redeemed ash was redeemed only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet roasted then when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, me faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made
our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices, though heaven at lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began, sing, Oh, we're free. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began, Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song. Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace, so free, washes over. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Sing it again. You have made us new. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. We sent this out to the church yesterday, so I'm still fresh on this one. Here we go. Your blood is healing every wound. Your blood is making all things new. Your blood speaks a better word. Your blood, the measure of your love, your blood, more than I deserve, your blood, speaks a better word, speaks a better word, it's singing out with life. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Sing verse 1 again. Your blood. Healing every wound, your blood is making all things new. Your blood speaks a better word. Your blood, the measure of your love, your blood. More than I deserve, your blood speaks a better word, speaks a better word. Sing it out. It's singing out with life. 
spirit shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Sing verse 3. Your blood. A robe of righteousness, your blood, my hope and my defense, your blood, forever covers me, forever covers me. Sing it out. It's singing out with light. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's calling out my name. It's calling out my name. It's breaking every chain. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's rewriting our history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ is rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's singing out with light. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Calling out my name, it's breaking every chain, it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stay. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. Verse 2. Your kindly rule has shattered and broken the curse of sin's tyranny. My 
life is hidden neath heaven's shadow your crimson blood covers me your crimson blood covers me Lord before me we have no other king but Jesus Lord is better make my heart believe in every victory Jesus is better make my heart believe than any comfort Jesus is better One announcement to make, and then kids, less kids today, some kids can go. Um, just want to make everybody aware of what we're going to be doing on the 4th of July. The 4th of July is on a Sunday. So as Tyler and Jordan and I have been praying about that uniqueness of the 4th of July landing on a Sunday and what to do about it, we thought we would really make that Sunday a, a focus for go. So it really is going to be a go Sunday. So rather than us, us gathering as a large group, we're going to be encouraging everyone to create picnics over the weekend, maybe not even on Sunday, where you can invite as many people from our church, from your community group, from your group of three that you want to be there, along with your friends or neighbors who don't know Christ. And the hope would be that we kind of do some picnic hopping over the weekend, because some of you are going to say you'd rather do it on Friday or Saturday, some of on Sunday. But to really make the focus of that weekend of how many people that don't know Jesus can we hang out with and spend time with over that weekend. 
Um, and then on Sunday morning, we want to encourage you guys to gather. I, I'm imagining a lot of the picnics will happen Sunday afternoon. So we just wanted to encourage everyone to gather then on Sunday morning prior to when your picnics are going to happen. Get together with your community group, groups of three, some kind of subgroup, whatever you want to create, and pray together. Just spend some time praying together. You can review last Sunday, the previous Sunday's message. Um, and then just get ready to, to love on and to encourage your neighbors. And as always, the, the cost of all this is, is paid for by your giving. So you just save receipts and bring them to us. Or if you need cash up front, let us know. Um, and we'd love to just support having just a whole bunch of picnics over that weekend that we can be a part of together. Um, and some of you guys may want to do them at a park. I know that a couple of guys had, a, had one at uh, one of the parks a couple weeks ago. Just got a group of people together. They went to the park. And then they just hung out with people that were there playing games and stuff and shared food with them. So whatever, whatever creative way you want to do this, we just want to really set you free on that Sunday um, we've believed this, right, for eight years, that, that we are the mission. God has called us to be on mission together. And so the beauty of, of us having a Sunday, just let's go at it. Let's get out. Let's love people. Let's spend time with people, whatever that looks like for you and the people that you know and the people that are Christians that you know and how they do it. So let's kind of unify and then let's scatter and, and bring the gospel to Jesus' love to our neighbors. Amen? So that's the plan. All right. Now the kids can go to Christ Kids, and then in a minute or two, we will start in Genesis chapter 4.
Genesis chapter 4. We're moving right along to the book of Genesis. So I'd like to pray for us, and then Ruth is going to read chapter 4 of Genesis. And then we're going to take a little time seeing what God has for us out of this chapter. So let me pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your generous, loving hand that's on our lives. Day in and day out, you are so good and so kind, and so loving, such a wonderful provider, and we honor you and we thank you for all the blessings that you have poured down on us, even just this morning since we woke up. We recognize that your love and your grace have been new again this morning, fresh, flowing over us. So thank you for that. Thank you that your grace and your love never get stale or old or begrudging, but it's always filled with joy and abundance. And we honor you and we thank you for that. And Lord, as we read into your word this morning, we ask that you would help us. We always need your help when we come to your word. God, our, our, our souls can be passive sometimes. Our, our souls can be lethargic. And so um, we are coming to what you want to tell us, and it is alive and it is active, and we want it to land on us that way. And so we need your spirit to help us, that this would not be dull or boring or familiar, but instead, God, that what you want to say to us individually and as a church through this passage, that it would, that it would enliven us and that it would stir our hearts with fresh zeal and affection and love for you and that as, as each word is read and as we look at it together that we would we'd understand clearly what's being said and that we would not just understand it but believe it and then our belief would grow into love for you which would lead to action and and being obedient to what you want us to do god we pray for that we we need your mercy to work in our hearts this morning Lord, lest this be just a fleshy activity. God, we believe this is, a, this is a moment to experience your presence and your power in a fresh way. And so come, Holy Spirit. Come, we need you. Bless this time. Anoint this time. Work in our hearts during this time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Genesis 4. Genesis 4. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. 
He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, Ruth. Well, since this is a narrative, as Genesis is, I want to just use the way the story unfolds this morning to look at major themes and major things that God is doing. There's sort of these six movements or six little snapshots, and I want to walk us through those. But as we do, before we even get to those, I just want to tell you what I think the main point is of this passage. Like, why does this story exist? You should probably ask that when you open your Bible. Why, why is this here? What is, it, what is it teaching me? What does God want me to see about himself and about myself? And, and, and what is the main point? So here's what I think the main point of this little section of Genesis chapter 4 is all about. And that is this. With mankind now possessing the knowledge of good and evil, their only hope is in Eve's serpent-crushing offspring. I think that's what this is all about. <laughs> With mankind, right, we learned last week, mankind now possesses the knowledge of good and evil. That is a very bad thing. And we're going to find out how bad it is as we get into chapter 4 here. But now that mankind has the ability or the knowledge of what is good and now is making decisions on their own for what's good and for what's evil, we have no hope except in this offspring that God has promised to Eve who will one day crush the serpent's head. And so these movements through this story are all God's people gathered, reading this, whether it's us or whether it was originally as the story is unfolding, wondering, where is this serpent killer? We want him. We need him. We depend on him. And so the first movement I think we can see in this story is really good news in verses 1 to 4. This is really, really good news. We need an offspring of Eve who's going to crush Satan's head. And then you get to chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother, now Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So we have good news. We've got an offspring. We've got someone who's on the scene who could be the Satan crusher. I mean, really, to get into the, 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 the mood of this, you have to get into Adam and Eve's bare feet and enter what they're going through. They've lived sinlessly in paradise. We don't know for how long, but for a season before they rebelled. And even if it was just a few weeks, you can't imagine how crushed, I mean, just how depressed and grieved they must have been over this new life outside of the garden, dealing with this new knowledge of good and evil. And they must have been absolutely off the charts with excitement now that they've got this child who could perhaps be the one who will put things back the way they used to be by getting rid of the serpent. And not, to, not only does have one offspring, they have two. I can't imagine not hoping, maybe they'll tag team this thing. Maybe they'll both get together and crush Satan's head. So there's joy here. This is all great news. And, and both of these guys seem to have a relationship with God. They're both bringing offerings to God. I mean, you can feel the excitement in these first four verses. Satan is going down. The offspring have been born. But then we get to verse 5. And we begin to wonder if we started celebrating a little too soon. So look at verse 5 with me. Or the end of four. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. 
I'm going to keep reading. But for Cain and his offering, it had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry, and why has your face fallen? So here we have the hope of these two offspring that will crush Satan's head. And immediately we realize that son number one has some serious anger issues. It says he's very angry. He's angry because God has not accepted his offering. Now I just want to pause here just to make note of something. It's very different from chapter 3 than what we see in chapter 4. In chapter 3, Adam and Eve are tempted from the outside, right? Satan comes along and, and he's the one who's speaking lies to them. Here, there's no Satan on the scene. Now it's coming from the inside. Sin has entered man's heart, and now Cain is very angry, and he is very angry at God. So how does God deal with this first very angry man? What's God going to do? How is God going to interact with him? Well, let's look at verse 6. God said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So verses 6 and 7 there, we see how God responds to an angry, the very first angry man. Any of you guys ever been an angry man? Ever had moments where you're just furiously wrathful, angry? That's where Cain's at. And what does God do? I want you to notice first that God pursues Cain. God approaches Cain. God approaches Cain in his anger just like God approached Adam and Eve when they were in the garden and had sinned. There seems to be a pattern developing here. God has a habit of pursuing sinful people. That's a pretty good habit, right? If you're going to have a God, I want a God who does this. He keeps pursuing sinful people, even very angry people. He continues to pursue. And when he pursues them, what does he say to them? What does he say to Cain? Well, he encourages Cain. He warns Cain. And God tells Cain what to do to escape having an angry heart. What does he tell him? Well, he tells him two main things. Verse 7, he tells him to do well. He says, if you do well. And then he also says he wants him to rule over sin. He tells him to rule over it. So do well. If you do well, rule over your sin, you can escape this anger. Verse 7, he uses love this. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Sin is is crouching. He's supposed to rule over it. Don't let it get the best of you. You need to kill it. It's almost like God knows anger is a gateway sin. You get angry, it's going to lead to all kinds of other sin. And so God personifies sin to let Cain know that it will attack you. It will attack you. It's crouching, waiting to pounce on you, Cain. You guys have seen enough probably those documentary kind of things where the lion is down in the grass, right? And he's the same color as the bushes and the dirt. So he blends in and he's moving slowly, crouching, waiting to attack a gazelle or something that's running through the woods. That's the picture. There's a wild cat crouching down named Sin, and it's hiding, and it's ready to pounce. Sin is not passive. It is active. And here, Satan's not the enemy. It's coming from within. There's sin, and it's ready to pounce on him. And God says to Cain, strike it first. Strike first. Rule over it. Dominate it. Don't let it get the best of you. So that's the first thing. The second thing he says to Cain is that you need to do well. If you do well, he says to Cain. That's kind of an odd thing, right? Even in context here, it's like, what does that mean? What does it mean for Cain to do well? What was the real issue with Cain and his sacrifice so that he didn't do well the first time, but he's supposed to do well the second time? What what does doing well look like compared to what he had done before? So what was wrong with Cain? What was wrong with the sacrifice that he brought? Why was Abel's accepted and Cain's not? Well, some believe that the issue with Cain was that he did not bring an animal blood offering. So Abel's was accepted because his was a blood sacrifice, and Cain's wasn't because it was a grain sacrifice. The problem with this interpretation is that it's not in the text. (laughs) It doesn't say that. That's the first problem. 
The second problem is that is that later in the Old Testament, we're going to see that God enjoys grain offerings. He wants them. He loves a grain offering. So it seems that that's not the issue here. Okay, so, so then what do you do? Right? You're reading your Bible, and you're like, all right, what does it mean to do well? It certainly isn't that he needs to go back and order, you know, offer up a blood sacrifice. So what do you do when you run into a problem? You make something up. What do we do? Good, we start searching. Yep, we, we start to move in rings a little further from the text until we find the answer. So in this case, you have to keep reading and reading and reading and reading and reading and reading until you get to Hebrews 11. <laughs> and Hebrews 11 gives us the answer, which I love. So Hebrews 11 says this, verses 1 to 4. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. You guys see the verse? I'm going to ask you the question. According to Hebrews 11, what made Abel's sacrifice acceptable to God? Faith. Faith is what made his sacrifice acceptable. What commended Abel as righteous? Faith. What made Abel's sacrifice commendable to God? Faith. What made God accept Abel and his gift? Faith. It's all of faith. Abel came with faith. Cain did not come with faith. So what is faith? If we go back up to the first part of that verse, it tells us, chapter 11, verse 1, what faith is. Faith is the assured hope in what we can't see. It's you having confidence and belief in something you can't see. So what is Abel hoping for that he can't see? What are they hoping for in Genesis 3 and 4? The serpent crusher. So Abel has faith that God is going to send an offspring, and maybe he's thinking himself when he offers a sacrifice, I don't know, or his brother Cain, but he has faith. He believes that God is going to send the serpent crusher. He believes it, and so God accepts his sacrifice. And so the verse here in Hebrews says, Abel is dead, yet it said in Hebrews, he still speaks. Did you see that at the end? Abel is still speaking. Abel has something to say to us this morning. That's what Hebrews ends with. So what is Abel saying to us this morning? Well, if you listen carefully, you'll hear, hear Abel. And here's what Abel says. Make sure your faith, all of it, is set in Christ as the only chance you have to be commended, accepted, and righteous before God. If Abel were here, this is what he's speaking to us. Don't set your confidence in your serving, in your sacrifices, in your good works, in your obedience. Have faith in the serpent crusher. That's what he would say. And I think he'd also would say, church, pay attention to how much Cain and I are alike from the outside. I think he would draw our attention to that immediately. I think he would say, look at me and look at my brother. We both talk to God. We both believe in God. We both know God personally. We both brought sacrifices to God and offering to him. But Cain's belief was lifeless. I mean, it's kind of like what James says, right? Demons have perfect theology. They believe it all. They get it right. But they certainly don't believe in a way that saves them. And I think it's what Abel would say to us. It is possible to know God, talk to God, believe in God, and make sacrifices to God, yet still not have saving faith and be accepted by God. That's what Cain would warn us of. He would say, there's a warning here for us. You can look like you're a disciple of Jesus on the outside, but not be one on the inside. And God sees our hearts, and he knows what's happening on your inside. And what he's looking for is faith. 
He's looking for you to have faith in Christ, to love Christ, to treasure Christ, to savor Christ, to have Christ be your life, for Christ to be everything we sang about this morning, better than anything else we could ever, ever have or desire. Faith in Christ is the difference here between Cain and Abel. Cain did not have faith. He didn't believe that God would send the serpent crusher. Abel did. So there's the warning. I mean, I know we talk about this and it, it, we know this, but we need to really, I think, embrace it sometimes that we can attend church, we can sing in the band, we can serve in Christ kids, give generously, be part of a community group, and do all the right things, and your heart can still be far from God. And that's the warning of Abel. Don't be like that. Don't have Cain faith. Have Abel faith. So that's the warning here in Genesis 4. It's a warning to you. It's a warning to me. What kind of faith do you have? Are you believing and loving and living with faith in the hopes that one, in the hope of someone and hoping in someone that you've never seen? <laughs> right? It's almost insane, isn't it? Unless the Spirit of God has revealed Christ to you. We are believing in someone we have never seen. Our faith is in someone we've never seen. So this morning, I think we were being graciously warned by God and by Abel to question, do we have Cain faith or do we have Abel faith? I feel like God is looking each one of us in the eye and saying, are you doing well? Are you doing well? Just like he looked at Cain and said, you can do well. He's asking us, are you doing well? And I think when he asked him that question, he's offering Cain the opportunity to repent. This whole conversation is about repentance. He's opening the door for Cain, saying, Cain, if you want to, you can repent right now. If you do well, resist Satan or resist your sin. Put it to death. Don't let it, don't let it attack you. And do well. Have faith. And things will go well with you. You'll be accepted. So what does Cain do? Does he repent? Well, verse 8 tells us. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and they were in the field. Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. God's gracious warning turns into grievous sin. Cain does not do well. Cain lets sin rule over him. And instead of Cain crushing Satan's head, Cain crushes his little brother's head. The very first human born on the earth is a murderer, and the second human born on the earth is murdered. That's a picture of what happens when man decides what is good and what is evil. A big brother will beat his little brother to death out of anger at God and perhaps jealousy that his brother got accepted and he didn't. I mean, in this murder, we see the fulfillment of God's warning that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. There's a wide variety of ways we die. We die spiritually, we die physically, we can die eternally, our souls die, and the means by which flesh death happens could be any, and here it happens for the very first time through that murder, through the hands of a brother. And now it seems that hope is gone. And that's the point of this murder. We lose hope for that offspring who is going to crush the serpent's head. Offspring one is a murderer, so he's not going to be able to do it. And offspring two is now dead, which means hope is dead. I can't imagine the conversation Adam and Eve had with Cain after he kills Abel. And he realized the serpent's going to be around for a little longer than what they expected. And so how does God respond to this? How does God respond to Cain's murder? Well, we see in verses 9 to 16 that he brings gracious punishment. It's a fourth movement through here. He brings gracious punishment. Look at verse 9 with me. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. 
Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me away today from the ground, and from your face shall I be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. God here is bringing gracious punishment. Yes, it is punishment. Just like with Adam and Eve, right? They're hiding. God comes to them and says, where are you? God now comes to Cain asking, where's your brother? Where is he? The similarities between chapter 1 and 2 are vivid. But don't miss this. I don't want you to miss, once again, God is moving towards Cain. You know, Cain gets totally irate with anger. God comes to him and gives him a chance to repent. He goes and murders his brother, and God moves towards him and starts asking him questions. I believe giving him a second chance, perhaps even to repent. That's what's in the question. Where's your brother? And Cain could have wept before God in that moment and responded with, I didn't listen to you. I let sin rule over me. I didn't do well. I killed my brother. Have mercy on me, God. I'm broken over what I've done. He could have responded like David. David was a murderer. And what did God do? Abundant mercy, right? Abundant mercy. Cain could have repented and cried out to God for mercy. But he didn't. Cain's response tells us much about Cain's heart. His response to God's question, where is your brother, is laced with wit and sarcasm. In the Hebrew, it actually reads, am I the keeper of the one who keeps sheep? He basically is mocking the question. Am I the keeper of the keeper? He's a play on words as if he thinks he's some kind of clever poet as he responds to God's question about his brother. So God brings this threefold punishment, right? You're going to be cursed. From the ground, the first time a person is cursed is here. No longer will the ground yield its strength. That's the second part of it. And the third is you will be a fugitive wandering on the earth. So God dishes out this punishment to Cain. And Cain's response response isn't, well, I'm getting what I deserve, God. You're right. You're just. I killed my brother. I'm an angry man. This is what you should do to me. Instead, his response is more blubbering. The punishment is... Greater than I can bear. Everything is about Cain. Cain is Cain-centered in every way. He is proud and arrogant. All he cares about is himself. And so his response here tells us more about this man's faithless heart. And so what about the punishment? Well, to be a fugitive and a wanderer back then meant you didn't have a house Right? You didn't have a field that you could plow and harvest from. You didn't have regular access to water. You're just wandering around all over the place with no protection from anyone. And so he knows, I'll probably just end up getting killed while I'm out there wandering in the wilderness somewhere. And so what does God do? He graciously puts a mark on Cain to protect him from coming to a swift end. We don't know what the mark was. Jewish tradition, rabbis have written that they believe it was a bulldog. (laughs) Straight up, serious. (laughs) And that it would protect Cain. If somebody went to attack Cain, the dog would go at him and eat the guy. I don't know where they came up with that. I don't think we know from the text or from anywhere else in the Bible (laughs) what the mark was. But we got to see the grace in this, that God still protects Cain. He's protecting him from dying in a similar way that he killed his brother. I mean, that is just mercy and grace on Cain. But there's one part of the punishment I think that is far worse than the other. I don't know how it landed on you. I had to read it a couple of times before it landed on me the way I think it's supposed to. In verse 14, Cain says, From your face, God, I shall be hidden. From your face, God, shall I be hidden. And in verse 16, it says, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. The first time any human would be away from the presence of the Lord. The first time any human would be hidden from the face of God. I think this line is perhaps the most tragic line of the entire story. Cain is now separated from God. The one thing for Adam and Eve 
it's one thing for Adam and Eve to be removed from the garden, right? They're out of the garden, but they're still with God. It's one thing for Cain and Abel to be outside of the garden Eden, but they're still with God. But now we find man is cursed and God's face is going to be hidden from Cain and he's going to be excluded from God's presence. This really is the worst and ultimate thing that could ever happen. You want to punish someone, God? This is the way to punish them in a way that will bring the most pain. And this warns us that if we have the faith of Cain, we will receive the curse of Cain. They go hand in hand. If you have the faith of Cain, you will be separated from the face of God. If you have the faith of Cain, you will be cast away from the presence of God. This is the sacrifice that Cain had to bear because of his sin. Now there's so many gospel parallels in this passage. It's hard to always know when to stop and share them. But there's one here that's just, I think, screaming out of this story, even through Cain and Abel, both of their lives, because you realize that another man will be born, and he will exit a garden, and the earth will open up and receive his blood, and God's face will be hidden from him, and he will be away from the presence of God, so that by faith and repentance, we never have to face the curse of Cain. That's, that's the beauty of the way this story is written. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foreshadowing. It's all, these imi- all this imagery of garden and blood being soaked into the earth and God's face being hidden in it and all these things that Christ experiences on the cross so, fa- so that through faith in him, we don't have to experience the curse of Cain. But our story here is not over. Back to Genesis. Because we have the fifth movement in this passage is that this grievous sin of Cain's is just repeated again. That's what verses 17 to 24 are all about. Lots of names. Ruth nailed them all. Hard to read. But what's going on there? It's really just to show us it's happening again. Things are getting worse. Now, there's this, there's this beautiful little overlay of culture starting. I think I told you guys we did, we did our overview of Genesis. That Genesis is the beginning. So here we have the beginning of culture. There's the first city. Bronze and iron are being forged to make things. Musical instruments are being crafted. Culture is starting to happen. But in the middle of that good sort of news, we see that Cain has a great, great grandson named Lamech who repeats his great, great grandfather's sin and adds to it. Because we see that Lamech has two wives. So with the invention of forging bronze and iron is the invention of polygamy. (laughs) Not God's plan. And then second, we see Lamech repeating the sin of Cain by being a murderer. And the way we find out that Cain is a murderer is really sad. We found it out because he is calling his wives together and he's using this new invention of music to boast about it. He, he takes the time to write a song about his murder so that he can boast about it in front of his two wives. I mean, that is just terrifying Verse 23, this is how far sin has gone. It's not that he, he murders somebody and then he runs and tries to hide. No, he murders someone and then he writes a song and he sings about it. Ada and Zila, hear my voice. Verse 23, you wives of Lamech, listen to me. Listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. And we don't know whether it was an, one man and then a young man, but at the very least we know that whoever he killed, one of them was young. So he's killing someone young and he's boasting about it. That's how far things have gone. It's almost like Cain kills his, king, his kid brother, and now we've got Lamech killing a young man. It's pathetic. It's sad. It shows you the, un- the unraveling of mankind. So now Cain and Lamech are living separate from God, and ultimately the problem is they are determining for themselves what is good and what is evil. That's it. And so I think it's a moment in the story, although it's not over yet, to pause, to warn all of us, perhaps to warn those of you who are younger in this room than those of us who are older, that your heart, left on its own to decide what is good and evil, is a very dangerous thing, a very bad thing. And the only place you're going to be able to go so that you can make accurate decisions over what is good and what is evil is the internet. God's word. And the sad thing is that you can go on the internet 
And you can find someone who claims to be a Christian, who will use God's word, who will tell you that things that are evil are good, and they will manipulate scripture and verb tenses and how we, how we translate words so that God's word can say whatever your heart desires. And I've read many of them. I've listened to many of them preached, and it is terrifying. So just a big warning. If your heart is bent in a direction and you go on the internet to try to find somebody that will agree with the way your heart is bent, you will find them. And they will say they are Christian and they will use Bible verses. So be warned. You do not want to be on your own trying to decide what is good and evil. You need to go to God's word and to God's spirit to decide, let God decide what is good and what is evil, lest we live like Cain and Lamech and suffer the consequences. Well, the story's not over yet. There's one last ending here, and I love it because it's great news. It's, I, I love it when God does it. He, he bookends this section with good news. It begins with Cain and Abel, offspring, crush, serpents, crush Satan's head, get back to the garden the way things used to be. Oh, failure. And then he ends this section of the story with good news again, good hope. Look at verses 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another, and there's the key word for us from Genesis 3, an offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So double hope here. First, people are starting to call on the name of the Lord. That's really good. Maybe, maybe the murder. And having multiple wives, maybe that will slow down or come to an end. People are actually turning to the Lord. And then the, the second good news is we have an offspring to replace Abel. We have an offspring. That word was used intentionally, I think, so it will trigger our mind to go back to it. God promised Eve, you're going to have an offspring. And so everyone's ending chapter 4 going, will Seth be the serpent head crusher? <laughs> will Seth be the man? Will Seth reverse the impact of the fall? So we can go back to the garden so we don't have to be the ones deciding what is good and evil anymore. Is Seth going to rescue us? Hope's alive at the end of chapter 4. But you have to wait till next week to find out if he's the serpent killer or not. But in the meantime, the New Testament has one more thing to say about this story which sheds light on this whole thing that happened with Cain and Abel. And it's from Hebrews 12. So Hebrews 12, right before these verses that you're going to read in a second, it's about, it's about the mountain where Moses would go. You guys remember the story? And the mountain is, there's lightning, and if you touch the mountain, you die, and it's scary and terrifying, and, and, and only Moses gets to go up it. And so he talks about that, the author of Hebrews does, and then he gets to verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. So he's going to have all these places that he's, we are arriving at. This is us. But you, but we have come to Mount Zion. I know some of these things don't make sense to us right now, but I'm not going to unpack them all. But we just got to get the gist of this. So, but you, you've come now, not to Mount Sinai, where there's lightning and fear, and, and you touch it and you die. But now you've come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of our friend Abel. Interesting. So what does this mean? Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That means Jesus' blood is speaking something, and, and Abel's blood is speaking something. He's saying something to us. His blood is speaking to us. What is he saying? Well, in chapter 4, verse 10 of Genesis, we read that the voice, this is what God says about Abel, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So his blood is crying. His blood is speaking. But now, Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Now the voice of Jesus' blood is crying to God from the ground, and it has something better to say than Abel's blood that was crying from the ground. Stick with me here. Make the connections. Abel's blood is saying something. Jesus' blood is saying something else. Abel's blood spoke. It said, I was a righteous man who died at the hands of an angry sinner. 
Jesus' blood speaks, I was the righteous man who died at the hands of angry sinners. Abel's blood spoke, my brother was a horrible brother keeper. Jesus' blood speaks, I am the perfect brother keeper. Abel's blood speaks, put your faith in the coming offspring of Eve. Jesus' blood says, I am the offspring of Eve. Abel's blood spoke, set your hope, your faith in the one who will crush Satan's head. Jesus' blood speaks, I crushed Satan's head. Abel's blood spoke, don't put your faith in your good works or in your sacrifices. Jesus' blood speaks, put your hope in my works and in my sacrifice. Abel's blood spoke of a future mediator. Jesus' blood says, I will make mediation happen for you between myself and the Father. It's all good news. Righteous Abel's blood was spilt, taking away hope. Righteous Jesus' blood was spilt to bring hope. They both are speaking. Abel's blood speaks to the future. Jesus is the fulfillment of that with his blood. So Jesus' blood really is pleading forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood is the blood of a new covenant. So in essence, we were hoping in Abel. I know we didn't hope very long because the chapter ended quickly, but we were hoping in Abel and his blood and what he was going to do. But it didn't produce, did it? And so now we look to Christ, and we hear his blood speaking a better word. His blood speaks forgiveness. His blood speaks love. His blood speaks mediation. His blood speaks new covenant. So ultimately, the story of Cain and Abel really foreshadows and points to Christ and his blood and him being a better mediator than Abel was able to be. So we look to Christ this morning, and we listen to him ask us, how are you doing are you doing well? Is your hope set on your good works, your behavior, how you acted last week, how you loved your neighbor, or is your hope set in Christ? Is it set in him and in him alone? Are you doing well? Do you have the faith of Cain, or do you have the faith of Abel? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you so much for preserving this story for us so that we can see how you pursue us and how you offer opportunities for repentance over and over again. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us, God, if any in this room have the faith of Cain and not the faith of Abel. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would open their eyes to see that that you would give them the gift of repentance and that they would stop trusting in their behavior or their good works or their church attendance or their giving or their serving. And instead, they would cling to you as their only hope. God, grant us the faith of Abel that we might be commended this morning for having believed in you, for believing in you, for loving you. And so, Spirit, do that work in our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. Your blood is healing every wound. Your blood making all things new your blood speaks a better word your blood the measure of your love your blood more than I deserve your blood Speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's singing out with light. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. 
speaks a better word. Your blood, a robe of righteousness, your blood, my hope and my defense, your blood. Forever covers me, forever covers me. It's singing in God with light. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's calling out my name. It's calling out my name, and it's breaking every chain. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. The precious blood of Christ is rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ is making all things right. The precious blood of Christ is singing out with life. Shouting down the line, it echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's calling out my name. It's breaking every chain. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better word. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better I want to just encourage you this week to take some time to think about all of the blessings that flow from the blood of Christ. I love that song. It lists some, and there's so many more, that because of the blood of Christ, our lives have been completely flipped upside down and radically changed. So we're going to, for our benediction, do our scripture memory. How are we doing on this? Almost got it? All right. Maybe next week we won't put it on the screen. I didn't hear any amen to that. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Let's, can we read this together? And uh, may, may God's Spirit help us to believe what we read here. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also may reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. You're dismissed. Hope you guys have a great week walking with Christ.